Okay, John chapter 7. We're continuing our study in John this morning. Uh, with the Lord's help, we're going to look at quite a few things today. Uh, I want to give a little bit of a recap before we get too far into this, just to kind of refresh our memories uh, where we have been. Uh, the Lord had us uh, take a sojourning outside of John in our study as we've been going verse by verse through uh, for a few weeks now. And so I want to bring us back into to the focus of where we were. Uh, as, as Jesus is coming up to this Feast of Tabernacles, his, his brethren tell him, go on up and show yourself out and, and all of this. And he says, it's not my time yet. Um, your time is always ready, but it's not my time yet. And so later on, he, he tells them, you go on up. Uh, let's look at uh, chapter 7 and verse 8. It says, go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. And I want to remind us here how important that small word yet is. Without that word yet, Jesus Christ is a liar. Because he says, I go not up yet, but then he goes. Now, if I say, I am not going to walk out those doors today, and then I walk out those doors, you shouldn't trust a thing that comes out of my mouth because it just lied to you. But if I say, I'm not going out those doors yet, you go ahead. The Lord so leads you, just go ahead and leave, that's fine. But if, if you go ahead, I'm not going out yet, and then I go out those doors, is there a discrepancy there at all? No. But you go ahead and you look up in the majority, I say the majority because there's only one or two that don't word it this way. We're actually going to look at another place too. But they'll take that word yet out. I know the NASB does, the NIV does, the ESV, the RSV. Um, let's see here. Young's literal translation uh, takes that out. Uh, there's a whole, a whole slew of them that do. Those Bibles make Jesus Christ a liar. Not a single place in this book, in the King James Bible, will you find anywhere that Jesus is a liar. You won't find that. Why? Because he's the son of God and he's perfect. Why do we know that? Because of this book. Now, if you didn't know that Jesus Christ was perfect and the son of God, and you read that and you would see that, you would say, oh, okay, well, Jesus lied that one time, but it was only that one time. So it's probably not that bad. You see what happens when we try to take our doctrine from an imperfect book? Let's look at another place. I actually want you to turn to this one, Luke 2.33. We've gone over these before, uh, but they bear repeating again. Because this is, this, is, this is foundational. If you don't believe the Bible in front of you, in its entirety, you don't believe the God of that Bible. Jesus Christ himself said, if you don't believe Moses, you're not going to believe my words. He told the Jews that. You know why they don't believe Jesus today? Because they didn't really believe Moses. And they don't believe Moses. Luke 2.33 says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Not a problem there. Joseph, naming the man, his mother being Mary. Okay? Mary was a virgin. That is absolutely pivotal in the doctrine of the deity of Christ. Because if Joseph... Or another man was the father of Jesus Christ? Well, the sin line started at Adam. And by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And then death was passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That bloodline of Adam would go from Adam to Seth, to Noah, to David, Jeremiah. I mean, all, you go all, all the way. I know Jeremiah wasn't in the lineage of Christ, but you get what I'm saying. All the way down to Joseph. And if Joseph was the father of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is accursed. He's a cursed man. Born with the sin of Adam in his blood. You understand the power of that blood? You understand how important that is? That that is to be perfect, sinless blood? There is no possible way sinless blood could be sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven and God would say, I'm satisfied. Could not happen. We are looking at doctrinally why Jesus Christ had to be virgin born. Now, you go to those same Bibles I just listed out. It says, and his father and mother marveled. Or his parents marveled. Some form of that. 
Those Bibles make Jesus accursed. You can't ignore that. It isn't just, oh, well, that's one place where it's wrong. Listen, your Bible's either right or it's wrong, period. Not a single place in this King James Bible will you find where Jesus Christ is accursed, except when he was hung on that tree and made sin for you. But he wasn't made sin until he got to that tree. Because the Bible says, cursed is every man that hangeth on a tree. He was cursed from God for you. He was made your sin. He was beaten by God. It pleased God to bruise him, remember. We learned that just a couple weeks ago. Mm. But Joseph and his mother, no problem in that. But his father and mother, yeah, there is. Now, why is it a problem? Let's go a little further. We're going to back this up with Scripture. Turn with me, if you would, really quick to 1 Corinthians 12.3. 1 Corinthians 12.3. The reason I'm turning to this, I want you to see it with your own eyes. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. Where I, wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And now it continues on and says, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. That gives you indication of when Paul was actually saved. He was saved on that road to Damascus. It wasn't later on, just before he got baptized, or when the scales fell from his eyes, or, or whatever. He says, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was indwelling Paul, Saul the Pharisee, at that moment when he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You would not see a Pharisee call Jesus Lord, except he became his Lord at that moment. Okay, But we're looking at the first part of this verse. No man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Any spirit that does call Jesus accursed is this spirit of Antichrist that now worketh in the children of disobedience. All right? That spirit of Antichrist, as it says in 1 John, it is in the world today. This spirit that gives you almost Jesus, but not quite. The Antichrist is the one that will come in on a pale horse. Jesus rode in on a white horse. And there's a difference. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished. And again, that's not thoroughly. That's throughly furnished. That word is perfect for that because it means touching each and every part of you. Throughly furnished unto all good works. Now, if all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, what spirit, then, would call Jesus accursed and make him a liar? Aren't those verses in there part of all Scripture? Second Peter. I want you to turn to Second Peter now. Second Peter chapter 1. This is just the introduction to the introduction. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Now let's look at verse 19. It says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. You know who that day star is? Jesus Christ. Do you know that that light which shineth in darkness is Jesus Christ? It is the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You know why it can't comprehend it, why it can't grasp it, why it can't fathom it? Because it's darkness. That is why it's difficult for some people to grasp the concept of a perfect Bible. I challenge you with this thought. Is God able to give you a perfect Bible in your language? Consider it for yourself. Is he even able to do it? Second question you have to ask, would he want to? 
kind of a God would hold you and five generations after you accountable for his word and not give it to you personally and perfectly. What kind of God is that? Honestly, that's the God of the Calvinist. And as we've talked before, Doug, that God is a jerk. That's not the God of the Bible. That's the God of Antichrist. Now, the last word, verse we're going to look at on, on this introduction to the introduction is 1 Peter 1.23. 1 Peter 1.23, remembering that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Being born again, not of corruptible, not corrupted, but corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Was the word of God only perfect in those original documents? Are you, are you a deist when it comes to the word of God? A deist is one who thinks that there is a higher power and there is a God, but we can't know anything about him. That he started the universe and he created everything, but then he took his hands off and said, well, we'll see how it turns out. You think he would do that with his word? That he will hold you accountable to on the judgment day? Jesus Christ himself said, these words will judge you. Now, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Incorruptible means it's not able to be corrupted, cannot possibly be corrupted. What your Bible tells you right there is that there has to be a perfect Bible somewhere. And it's not in dusty caves or a monastery somewhere. Why would God hide his word like that? Now, he'll hide it in dark sayings and parables, and he'll reveal himself to the prudent, and he'll reveal himself to the foolish who are seeking diligently for him. But the very premise of all those other Bibles, going right straight back to Westcott and Hort themselves, was that the Textus Receptus and the King James Bible were full of errors, and that they had crept in, and that they had been corrupted over time. And so they decided, you know what, we need to find the oldest manuscripts possible to be able to get as close to the originals as possible, because if they believed, and this is of their own admittance, that their, those original manuscripts, as soon as they were copied over, errors began creeping in. And the more copies that were made, the more errors crept in, because obviously God took his hands off of it and doesn't care about his word. And the more time went on, the more error went in. So their mindset is, since the word of God is so corrupted today, we need to get back to the beginning of the, those original manuscripts, which no one alive today has ever seen or will ever see. And we need to get as close as we can to those to see what God actually said. What they are saying is that their Bible that they are holding today has been corrupted and they're trying to perfect it. What does that tell you about their salvation? According to what the word of God literally says to you here in this verse. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. If anybody does get saved from the preaching of an NIV Bible, it's because the preacher is preaching King James doctrine. End of story. So, John chapter 7. Go ye up unto this feast, I go not up yet. No problem there. What do you believe about your Bible? Over here in verse 14, this is now the midst of the feast. This is the, the middle of the, uh, the, the time of feasting. This was a, a seven-day feast, and the eighth day was to be this great day of the feast. And time probably won't permit us to get to that point uh, in, our, in our reading today. But we're going to read down through some of this. Uh, we're going to touch on a few things and see where the Lord leads us from there. But in John chapter 7, right at verse 14, it says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? The Jews marveled because the only ones that had any kind of scriptural authority at that time were the scribes. 
and they knew of the school of, of, of the Pharisees and how everything was to be going through, that this was the only, they were the only ones that had any kind of spiritual authority at all. But here this man is who speaks with authority. He already went into the, the synagogue and he cast out that evil spirit. And they marveled because this man speaks with authority and not as the scribes. But it continues on. Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, if you notice here the doing, this is part of that diligently seeking him. If any man do my will, you know what God's will is for you to diligently seek him. If you diligently seek him, you'll know the words of Jesus, whether they're of God or whether they're of some man that lived 2,000 years ago and died and is in a grave somewhere. You'll know. Because the word of God will speak to you in a way that no other book will. Amen. There's power in this book. Yeah. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood that bleeds from every single page of your King James Bible. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keep the, keepeth the law? Why go you about to kill me? I'm going to pause there for just a second. We're going to talk about the law again. The law of God is something that has been purged from modern Christianity to the downfall and the damnation of millions. A salvation that does not put a person under the law of God to show their guilt to a holy God by the law of God is not a salvation that will do anything for you in this life or the next. All that is is a simple popcorn prayer received with joy because, oh boy, that made me feel good, or oh boy, that scared me and I don't want to go to hell. But when you are put under the law of God, you are shown your guilt before a holy God. Were you broken when you got saved? Or were you just a child and asked Jesus into your heart? First John tells us, and honestly, we could spend all, of, all the afternoon going through First John, and we could be looking at time and time and time again, and proof and proof and proof and proof. This is a saved person. This is a lost person. This is what a saved person does. This is what a lost person does. This is what somebody looks like when they're born again by the Spirit of God. This is what somebody looks like when they're still lost. Those comparisons and contrasts are all through there. And if you would be honest with yourself, you would find yourself somewhere in there. You would. Now, if the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, and you see some things in your life that mar match a lost person, that ought to terrify you. Because you're about to fall into the chastening hand of God. Either that, or he's about to give you over to yourself. As we read in, in this morning, those that are shipwrecked, those that, that are, are made cast away, those that God gives over to themselves so that they might learn not to blaspheme. In his mercy, he'd give you over to you. In his judgment, he'd give you over to Satan. I've seen both. It's a terrifying thing. But even that's a mercy because... It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hand of Almighty God. But he calls them out. He says, none of you keepeth the law. You go about to kill me. I did one work. I healed a man on the Sabbath day. You'd pull your cart out of the ditch on a Sabbath day. You'd pull your cow out of the ditch on a Sabbath why, day. Why should not this child of God, whose father is Abraham, why should not they be made whole on the Sabbath day? You know, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. We've studied that out. We've studied that out in, in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Actually, we're going to be going through Hebrews chapter 4 today, so we're going to see it. I'm going to save that till later. That'll be good. John chapter 9. Look at verse 28. This is when that blind man gets healed, and he all of a sudden gets emboldened because this Jesus made him whole. And he's going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, once a blind beggar, now toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees, the religious elite. 
John chapter 9 and verse 28. Oh, I turned too far. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. They claim to be following Moses, but we already saw, if you don't believe Moses, you don't believe my words. John chapter 5 tells us that. Let's go there. John chapter 5, verse 39 is where we'll start. John chapter 5 and verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now remember, to testify something is to make a declaration. A testimony is your declaration. A witness is a declaration with proof to back it up. That's why the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the child of God. It will bear witness. It will not only declare this is a child of God, but it'll show you how you know that on the inward parts. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. That Holy One is the Holy One of Israel, remember. It is not the Holy Ghost. It is not the third person of the Godhead. It is Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel. Now, let's continue on here. Verse 40, And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. You see, God, Jesus knows you. You're not fooling him. He knows you hate everyone, and you think everyone is beneath you. He knows what's really in your heart. Maybe that's the dark corner of your heart you refuse to look at. You know, we've talked about that under the China cabinet. And usually China cabinets have really low trim, all right? So there's just a black line of shadow underneath there. And you'll sweep the whole house and you might get underneath the edge where the light kind of casts a little bit of a shadow under there. But it's always scary when a kid's car runs underneath there, isn't it? And you've got to go get it with a yardstick. How many parents have done that under your stove? All right, maybe not China cabinet, but maybe under the, the stove, okay? Honestly, when was the last time? Now, Miss Lois, we just did yours the other day. But when was the last time you cleaned under your appliances? Just think about it, okay? I'm not preaching against not cleaning under your appliances, but I'm using it as a word picture. You don't want anybody to look under there. You don't want your guests to see that. Why? Because it's dark. There's dust sasquatches under there. Many times they're far more than bunnies, okay? It's dirty. It's grimy. There's probably some marbles, some kids' toys, maybe a little cat food, I don't know, dog food, whatever. Probably some mouse droppings. And when you pull that, that thing out or, or you got to shine a light under there, it's scary. I don't want to look under there. That's terrifying. This, this story bears repeating again now. There, there was a child who uh, had lost his, uh, uh, what was it? It was a dime. We're going to use a dime for the illustration today. He had lost a dime. He had a bright, shiny new dime, and he was so excited to have this dime, and he lost it. And he's right on, on Main Street, and there's a barber shop here, and the police station's over here, and the bank's over there. And, and he's, he's looking all over for this thing. He's looking pretty distressed, and he's looking here and over there and over there. And, and uh, the policeman comes out and says, son, what are you looking for? And he's like, I lost my dime. Will you help me look for it? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. So he's a good policeman. Amen. Praise the Lord for our policemen. And so he's looking for this thing all over the place, and, and the policeman's helping him. The barber comes out, and what's going on? Oh, he lost his dime. Will you help us find it? Yeah, sure. So he, the banker comes out. Okay, this is Mayberry, apparently. And <laughs> so they're looking all over for this thing, right? And the police officer asks him, son, where was the last time you, you saw it? Like, where was the last time you had it? Oh, he says, I dropped it in that grate over there. The storm drain. It's like, well, why didn't you tell us that? Why didn't you want to, why didn't you tell us that that's where you lost it so we could get it out? He says, well, because it's dark and dirty in there. I didn't want to look in there. It was scary. Those are the corners of your heart that the preaching of the word of God will make manifest to you. Just do a quick read through 1 Corinthians 14. If you want to do it now, you can. But just look at what preaching does. In there, it calls it prophesying. It's declaring the word of God. But look at what preaching does to that lost person that comes into the service. The thoughts of his heart are made manifest. 
and he will declare of a truth that God is in you. That's why people don't want preaching. That's why people don't want a perfect Bible, because then, all of a sudden, they're actually accountable to one book. They're accountable to one God. They're accountable to a holy God who is powerful enough to use wicked men and sinful men to keep his word perfect. That's my God. I was just reading this morning. Oh, in, in Romans, Romans 1. Let's go there real quick. I mean, you don't have to. I'm going to. Because this is good. Romans chapter 1. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The problem with an almighty, powerful God who is able to create everything and to keep his word perfect is that you can clearly see him. And when you see God in his perfection, you see him in his holiness, and you see everything that you are not. Nobody wants to see that. That's under the stove. That's in the storm drain. That's dirty. That's wicked. Oh, can you only imagine if people knew what I was? Honestly, we could have Kelly bring the screen down. This is, this is an illustration that uh, Brother McVeigh used up in Wells, but we could have Kelly bring the screen down. And what if the secrets of your heart, those secrets, that everyone does have a secret, he said. You have a secret thing. Maybe your husband and wife don't even know about. What if God were to take and to actually write that thing out? Oh, can you imagine that? That's Miss Lois's secret. Can you imagine that? That's actually, that's Terry Miller. Oh, how disgusting. Can you imagine? Look at that. That's what, that's what is actually in Pastor Seely's heart. He did that? By the way, yes, I did. Such were some of you. But you're washed. But you're sanctified. But you are justified. Are you? Secrets of your heart made manifest. That's what happens when the preaching of the Word of God happens. Back in John chapter 5, verse 42, he says again, But I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Remember, we be Moses' disciples. They don't even believe Moses. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? That's why you can't unhitch from the law. That's why you can't unhitch from the Old Testament. We sang this morning in our opening song in, in Sunday school, free from the law, O oh happy condition. But if you've never been put under the law, you are still under the law. You are not under grace. You can't claim that you've embraced grace if you've never been confronted with your guilt before a holy God, with the law of God. Period. I don't care how long you've been in church, I don't care what you've done, how long you've played the piano, how long you've run sound booth, how long you've done nursery, how long you've taught children's church, how long you've cleaned these grounds. I don't care if you were one of the ones that first put the shovel in this ground here on this place. If you were never put under the guilt of the law of God, you are lost. And he will tell you as you stand before him on the day of judgment, depart from me, I never knew you. And then he's going to call all of your good works, all those smiles, all those wonderful Sunday school lessons, all the times you put up with the children in the nursery, all, all the cleaning that you did, the diligent spring cleaning. He's going to call all of that iniquity. He's going to cast you from his presence. 
And then you will spend eternity in the flame of his righteousness. In the flame of his word. That's where you'll spend it. Every single time you heard the law of God and it pricked you in your heart and you rejected it, you'll remember that. Jesus told Paul, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You're going to really let your pride take you to hell? There are some of us here today that ought to be terrified. I'm not trying to scare you into it. Listen, hell is a terrible thing, but it's nothing, absolutely nothing compared to what it'll be to stand before Jesus Christ with nothing to hide behind. Hebrews chapter 4, we'll go there. He's going to bounce us around a little bit, and I'm okay with that. Hebrews 4. Very, very familiar verse. We might get back into this to be able to give the full context of it, but this is what I want you to see. For the word of God is quick, verse 12, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That word quick means alive. Did you, did you know that? Okay. Um, when you cut your nails too far and it bleeds, it hurts, doesn't it? It cuts you to the quick. Okay. That's the living part of your nail. Grandmother used to say, go get me my thimble and be quick about it. She meant be lively. Well, in our colloquialism and in our, our uh, continual maturing of the English language, we get to the point where we say, oh, quick means fast. No, it just means be lively. So, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Ah, but there are some Bibles out there, quote-unquote Bibles, that are not sharp. That verse in Luke 2, 33, is a dull edge on that Bible. That verse in John chapter 7, verse 8, is a dull edge on that Bible. Listen, when I'm going into surgery... Pastor Cassiola is about to go in for surgery. He wants those scalpels to be beyond razor sharp. Back when they used to use obsidian, obsidian cuts on the molecular level. Okay, uh, If anybody knows what obsidian is, volcanic glass. And when it, when it is broken in such a way, it'll fan out. And it goes down to such a fine edge, it cuts on the molecular level. It separates molecules, not just cells. Okay, That's what they used to use to do eye surgery was obsidian knives. Now they use lasers and, and, you know, technology progresses and man degresses, but this Bible's sharper than that. There's not a dull edge on this thing. You look in here, it'll cut you wide open. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow isn't it interesting that the Word of God divides? And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know, your, the thoughts of your heart are wicked. Plain and simple. We've talked about this just recently, but again, it bears repeating again. The only place where you'll find the word imagination or imaginations in the Bible, 20 times in your King James Bible, imagination or imaginations is used. In every single one of those, where it connects it to a part of the body, it's always the heart, never the mind. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. How does he search it? For this. I try the reins. How does he try it? This. But we don't like that next part, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. We're talking in the men's class about some very difficult things. Why does this happen? Why did that one have to die? Why did this happen in my life? Why did that happen in my life? Look at the word of God and it'll tell you. You live after the flesh, you shall die. God gives to every man according to his ways. How is your way? God calls us to discern our way. He's going to give to you according to that. More than likely, you'll reap it in your children and your grandchildren. Exodus 20, verse 5 is still in the book. Look it up. 
Now, neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes with whom, and with whom we have to do. You can't hide anything from God. There's no corner of your heart that he doesn't see. To him, that screen is broadcast across eternity. He sees it all. He knows your secret. He knows exactly that moment you rejected him because, oh no, I did that as a child. Listen, the only time you're going to find blasphemy in the, in the Bible is when it's talking about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now, that blasphemy is attributing to Satan the working of the Holy Ghost. All right? Because Jesus was casting out devils, and the Pharisee says, oh, it's by the prince of devils that he casts out devils. And he says, you're committing blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Because they were attributing to Satan, Beelzebub, the power of casting out devils, when really it was God himself. Now, you're sitting under the preaching of the word of God. I can't tell you how many times I preached this. God have mercy on me for that. But how many times have you heard preached and taught? Oh, the devil will try to get you to doubt. Satan's going to try to get you to doubt your salvation. I told people, the 16 people that I led through the Romans road and through a prayer, I told them, now be on guard because Satan's going to try to get you to doubt your salvation, that it wasn't real and that you're still lost. Satan's going to try to get you to doubt that. Can I ask you just one really good rational question? Why would Satan want you to think that you're still lost? What good would that do for him? Give you another opportunity to seek salvation? Wouldn't he more than likely want you to go your entire life thinking you're saved, relying on a prayer rather than coming to repentance by God's hand? And you get to the end of your life and you close your eyes in death and wake up in flame. That's what he wants. So who is it that really is causing you to doubt? Now, false doctrine can cause you to doubt. With the Word of God rightly divided, and the true Word of God, the incorruptible Word of God, rightly divided, you have doubt as to whether or not you're saved or not? That's not Satan. That's not Satan. That's the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Convincing you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin because you believe not on me. John 14. That's the ministry of the Holy Ghost. When Felix heard the preaching of Paul, it says he trembled. You look in your Bible, and if your Bible is one that has different sections headed, okay, in Acts, I believe it's maybe 27, when he's in there and he's, he's there, it'll quite often say, Paul stands before Felix. But what really happened... Felix stood before Paul because he trembled and he rejected, almost persuaded, dying lost. That's the introduction. Mm. Since we're here in Hebrews, let's look at uh, chapter 3, verse 19. Going back to the, remembering that they, they could, they didn't believe. They didn't believe Moses, so they're not going to believe Jesus. It says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. This is speaking of the ones who came up out of Egypt. They were ex, uh, uh, exodized, I don't know, they came up out of Egypt in the exodus. How, how do you make exodus a, a verb? I don't know, they exited. But then they went through that wilderness. And there were some that fell in that wilderness. Why? Because of unbelief. They could not enter into the rest of God because of unbelief. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, and if you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. Those ones that fell in the, in the wilderness, the word preached did not profit them. 
not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And we heard about the faith of Christ. Galatians 2 tells us that. All right, it's the faith of Jesus Christ, not faith in Christ. By the way, you will not find that phrase, faith of Christ, in any other Bible but the King James Bible. Even the New King James changes it to in. Dull swords. For we which have believed do enter into his rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh, of the seventh day, on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in therein, must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day. Now that word limit, it means that he singled one out. He limited it all singled out to one day. Saying in David today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered therein into his rest, he hath also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Labor to enter into that rest. Oh, you say, but it's not of works. You're right. Work and labor are two different things. A Jew on the Sabbath day can labor, but he can't work. Work changes things. Labor is a maintaining. Okay? Only God does that work in you. That's why it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we labor to enter into that rest. What is that labor? That diligently seeking him. Or else you're going to be that hasty fruit of what it says in Isaiah 28. You'll be that fruit that received it with joy. That ground that received it with joy. Oh, but there were rocks in that ground and it had no depth of earth. And so it sprung up quickly. Oh, but as soon as persecution or, or tribulation ariseth, by and by, they're offended by the word itself. How did you receive the word? Did you receive it in unbelief? So, I know I believed. I, I, I believe. Yeah, the devils believe also. And they tremble. Felix trembled. Did all you do is receive it in trembling because you were afraid of hell? When you stand before Christ, how will that stand up? Hmm. Well, we could go more into the law. Let's do that. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. The Lord gave me liberty. I asked him. He said it was okay. Romans chapter 7. Starting right at verse 7. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. But men make it sin today, don't they? Oh, we, we don't, we're not under the law anymore. Oh, that's a terrible thing to us, to be under the law. No, we're in the age of grace. Not until you've been put under the law. Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. See, that's the problem. We tell people they're sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you stolen anything? Have you lied? Have you taken that thing from your mom? Have you disobeyed your parents? Have you committed adultery? All of that is sin. Yep, sure enough. Well, guess what? That little bit that you put in your spiel, that is the only law that person is going to receive. What about the rest of the law of God? I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. See, it's that death that's missing today. It's that death. Until you see yourself dead, you're never going to see yourself in needing of a resurrection. The work of an evangelist is not to bring revival. 
The work of evangelists is to evangelize, is to preach, is to preach the word of God. Lost people can't be revived. They can't be vived again. They can't be made alive again, okay, to bring fire back. They need to be vived, okay? Now, there are a lot of churches who are trying to bring revival. A lot of people in the church need to get really born again by a salvation that's been wrought in God and not by man. Oh, but, but Philip, Philip was, was this evangelist and he was that deacon and, and he went into Samaria and he preached this great revival there and, and people got saved and then the Holy Ghost called him to go into the, into the wilderness and, and there was one man there, that Ethiopian eunuch, and he was riding along in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah and, and, and the, he, he, he ran up alongside because the Spirit bid him to go and, and, and Philip said, understand it's what thou readest. The eunuch said, you know, uh, how can I except some man guide me, right? So I need to guide somebody to the Lord, and I need to show them this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, and then lead them to a prayer so that they can pray to ask Jesus into their heart, which you won't find any place in the Word of God where anybody was born again by asking Jesus into their heart. That's a heresy of the Baptist movement. It's not in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible... What is it? It's a heresy. <clears throat> Philip was there to guide him. All he did was started at that same scripture, and he preached Jesus. He said, is, is the prophet speaking of himself or of some other man? Now, this Ethiopian eunuch would have known about Jesus, would have heard. This was, this was big news all around. And when that Ethiopian eunuch heard from Isaiah and the Psalms and Moses that the great I am, that the Holy One of Israel, that the Messiah is this Jesus that died and rose again, he had enough foundation in his life that he believed on the spot. Is that possible today? Probably. But it'll be few and far between the ones who are actually prepared mentally, scripturally, doctrinally, to see their guilt before a holy God. Most of the time you have to start with, God gave us a perfect book. We're held accountable to this book. That's, that's where it has to start. Because it doesn't matter what I yell and scream and stomp and hoot and holler about that comes out of this book. If I'm talking to somebody that doesn't believe that he can give us a perfect book, or that he has given us a perfect book, and that we're held accountable to it, they're not going to take anything at what this says in here is fact. They'll hear the preaching, just as those did in the wilderness, but it won't profit them because it won't be mixed with faith in them that heard it. What faith is that? As we talked about this morning, the faith of Jesus Christ. That faith that he would not leave his soul in hell, neither would he suffer his holy one to see corruption. Peter preached that and said, that's Jesus whose soul was made an offering for sin. Can I ask you this? If Jesus' soul was not that burnt offering, whose was? Or whose will be? There had to be a burnt offering made. It wasn't enough that the thing died. The priest killed that lamb. Then what did they do? They sprinkled the blood. Then what did they do? They parted it and they separated it here and here. And then what did they do? They burned it. If all that's not fulfilled, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is null and void. And it did not do what the law commanded. And we're still lost. So whose soul was that that burned in hell? You know what's going to happen is those other Bibles are going to take that word hell and change it to Sheol. So you either believe that man is able to corrupt and that there can be no perfect Bible today, and you believe that there is no way we can really know exactly what man said. So I need to go back to the original languages. I got to go back as far as I can. And I got to study this thing out. And I got to uh, trust Thayer's Greek lexicon, which Thayer was a Unitarian who didn't believe in the deity of Christ. And that comes out in his definitions, by the way. And yet 99% of the Baptist preachers today are preaching Thayer's definitions. But all those other Bibles, they're going to take that hell right out of there. They're going to change I am to I was. 
They're going to take the deity out of Jesus Christ. They are going to make a mockery of the Son of God. As Leonard Ravenhill said, dare I sit by while my God is slighted? Dare my sword stay in its sheath while my king is attacked? Bibles are from Satan. They are. And the only way that you can really understand that is if God reveals it to you. Remember what Jesus told John, uh, Peter when they were there and they were talking and he asked him, what, what do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who, who do they say that I am? Well, some say they are a prophet, and some say Elias, and uh, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, and, and uh, Jesus said, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Do you remember Jesus' response to that? Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. There is no possible way you can believe that that is a perfect book unless God reveals it to you. I can give you so much proof I can show you the doctrinal reasons why. I can show you the historical reasons why. If we want to, we can go back even further and look at the manuscript reasons why. That book is perfect. But until God opens your understanding to it, it's not going to matter. It won't matter at all. But it's by faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. From a perfect word of God. Or are you okay getting faith from an imperfect word of God? One that's 98% okay. My eternity counts more to me than that. So, where were we at? Romans 7. Sin revived and I died. Verse 10. The commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made to death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin. That dark place under that appliance or that china cabinet. That it might appear bad and dirty. You have to take that light and shine it under there to see it. You may know it's there, but until you shine that light and see it. It's not going to amount for anything. But sin that it might appear sin worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. That's the problem today. We're actually going to close there. That's the problem today is that sin is not seen as exceeding sinful. What we see is the fruit of sin. Okay, that word sins in your Bible it isn't only the plurality of sin, but what it is, is it's the fruit of those sins. Sin is who you are. Sin is what you are on the inside before you're born again. Sins is the fruit of that sin nature. You lie. Why do you lie? Because you're afraid of getting caught by your parents. Why? Because you don't respect your parents. A man shot a guy because he tried to take his car he stole the car, shot the driver, and drove off. So he's guilty of murder. He's guilty of thievery. But what was the real, real motive behind that? Covetousness. What's the greater condemnation? That covetousness. What's the root of your sin? That's what God's trying to show you. What's hiding in the corners of your heart that you refuse to look at because, oh, I've cleaned up this fruit and that fruit. It doesn't matter how many times you pick the apples off the tree. Until you cut the tree down, the apples are going to come back. I don't know if you've ever cut a tree down, but they tend to grow from that cut-off stump. What do you got to do? Get the roots out. And that's the thing only Jesus can do. It's the only thing the Word of God can do. Jeremiah 23, 29. I told the men I was going to close with this, and I believe the Lord would have it. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? 
Father, thank you for this day. And Lord, we thank you for your word. My God, I pray that you are honored by what you heard today. Lord, I pray that you would take the things that were from you and Lord, burn it in our conscience, Lord, so that we cannot escape it. Oh God, reveal yourself to us in a way that only you can. We love you, Lord, and we are thankful that we can have your word. But God, take it and use it for your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the authority that he has given us in that name, I pray. Amen.